Hello everyone, welcome back. This week in the tutorial, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to move away just from drawing machines. We're going to start to explore the world of sound a little bit. Um, we're, we're still interested in generative systems, uh, but we're going to shift our focus to the audio domain and we're going to look at how we can take some of the strategies we've been talking about in the first five weeks of the course and apply them to uh, systems that are either based on concepts from sounds, like things like oscillators, which we're going to explore today, um, or using generative ideas to write maybe a program that's going to create a generative musical sequence, which we're going to explore next week. And in order to do sound in P5.js, we're going to need to rely on a sound library. So what we're going to do in this lesson today is um, just focus on kind of explaining the basics of working with sound in P5, because we've really emphasized drawing up until now. And um, we're also going to uh, introduce a new library called tone.js, which I'll explain in a second. And our examples are going to be focused around uh, just simple oscillators. Uh, so first we'll build an oscillator, uh, and then we'll talk about how um, even in you know something as simple as two oscillators, right, kind of playing against each other, uh, it can be something uh, that we can use as a source for uh, these sort of um, generative, you know, drones type sounds. Okay? And we'll create some visuals to go along with it. All right, so let's get started. Um, so I have started a new sketch here, and uh, before I forget, I always like to change these to fill the window, and let's go with a black background. Uh, and let's talk about the sound library that we are going to use um, for the next couple of weeks. Now, you may know that uh, with p5.js, we have um, we have a, uh, a built-in sound library that's included, uh, the p5.sound library. Uh, so if we, uh, if we look at our web editor here, look at the index page, um, there is this add-on that's always included for uh, p5.sound. Uh, now, this is a great library uh, and does a lot of the similar things that we're going to do with this new library I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it does have some, uh, some limitations. So it's meant to be fairly straightforward. And um, for what we want to do this week, and all, more importantly, next week, when it comes, it's going to come to sequencing and rhythm, uh, we're going to use a, a, just a different sound library. Both of them are built on top of the same um, web audio framework. They're just kind of different ways of packaging it. So rather than using the p5.sound library, we're going to use a library called tone.js. Uh, tone.js is just a little bit more powerful. Uh, it's got, it, it can do more. And um, when it's going to come to creating sequences, I think the tools that come with tone.js are going to be a little bit more useful to us. Uh, so we're going to use this library instead. This is the documentation page for tone.js. Um, the, the, the downside of switching to tone.js is that the examples are going to be a little bit more difficult to navigate, whereas the p5.sound library has got very clear example in the, that sort of p5.js fashion. Uh, tone.js uh, is not necessarily meant for p5. It's just a, a general web audio JavaScript framework. Uh, and as such, its examples don't really take into account p5.js. Uh, we can start already see that from the installation portion, right? That assumes we're using something called Node. Um, this is not the case for us, so uh, we have to sometimes connect the dots a little bit, um, but just wanted to point that out. So it has three sections here. Uh, the API is the most useful, um, where, where you can see sort of the list of all the objects that come with the library. Uh, today we're going to focus on something called an oscillator. So objects are documented, uh, and the documentation is pretty good for Tone.js. So every object comes with a few lines of code that demonstrate how to use it. Uh, you can also find here uh, some examples if you want to see some of the capabilities of the library uh, and demos. These are projects that are built using uh, Tone.js. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so before we dive into how Tone.js works, what can we do with it, uh, we have to first install the library. Now for us, obviously, we're not using uh, NPM or Node. Uh, so we're going to rely on a content delivery network. Uh, so I just Googled Tone.js CDN, uh, and I'm going to grab the minified version here just because it's a smaller file. So I'm going to copy the script tag. Uh, just like we installed that GUI before, we're going to go into our web editor here for P5, um, and we are going to, uh, now we're going to replace this uh, script tag here. We don't want to have both libraries installed together, uh, so I'm going to get rid of p5.sound. And instead, I'm going to copy the tag for uh, Tone.js. Okay. So <clears throat> step one, we install the library. 
I'm going to move that over now. Uh, oops, I'm going to switch back to our sketch and move that over. Okay, so uh, what that allows us to do now is we can start using, uh, we're going to close some tabs here, we can start using some of the Tone.js objects. So let's open up the API. And uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on oscillators. Um, oscillators are your basic waveforms. And we'll do both um, just audio oscillators, but at the end of the tutorial, we'll talk about also uh, low frequency oscillators or LFOs, and we'll have them modulate each other. Uh, so an oscillator um, has basically two main things we can define about it. It has a frequency, so that's the pitch that the oscillator is going to create, and it has a particular waveform. Uh, in in Tone.js, uh, there, there's four possible waveforms you can define for oscillators, a sine wave, a triangle wave, a square wave, or a sawtooth wave. And we'll just start with the sine wave to begin with. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, so we'll create a sine oscillator. And um, let's create a variable here. I'm going to call it OSC for short. So that's going to be our oscillator. Uh, and now this is where uh, things get a little tricky when we start to talk about sound in the context of the browser. When we're just drawing things, we can just kind of go ahead and use setup and start initializing our variables, create our objects, and so forth. Uh, when it comes to sound, we have to be a little bit more uh, careful, not careful, but a little bit more intentional in how we go about setting up our objects. The reason for that is we're not allowed to start any sound or create sound related objects uh, in the browser, unless the user has explicitly interacted with the window. What, the, what interacted means basically means has clicked on something, maybe clicked on a button or just literally clicking into the window, uh, just to, to signify, okay, this window has my attention. Uh, these policies are in place in the browser, as you can imagine, to prevent um, JavaScript programs from just starting to blast, you know, obnoxious sounds at you, unless you've interacted with them first, because uh, that would be really, really annoying. So this is a kind of like a security feature of web browsers. So what does that mean for us in P5 is that before we can create our Tone.js object, initialize them and so forth, we want to wait for a user interaction. So the first thing we're going to do is, is kind of define that a bit of that framework, uh, and we can reuse that framework in other Tone.js uh, projects. So how do we wait for user interaction? Well, first, it would be nice to give the user a prompt because they need to know, they need to kind of click in the window to get the thing going. So we're simply going to set a white fill here and um, I'm going to draw some text. I'm going to say, uh, click to start. Okay. And we're going to put that text in the center of the window like so. Uh, and it's a little bit off-center, actually, so I'm going to change the text alignment to center and center. So centered vertically and horizontally. Okay. All right, so now we've put a little prompt here for um, the user to know to click into the window. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to create a variable, uh, a Boolean variable. I'm, I like, I'm going to call it ready. Okay. And we'll assume when the program starts that we're not ready to go because the ready variable is going to be false. <clears throat> then in mouse pressed, we are going to take a look at this ready variable. And if it is false, we are going to make it true. Okay. So think of the ready variable as basically a, a switch that we're flicking on. Okay? <clears throat> and that will allow us to say in draw, we're going to say if we are ready, right, this is going to be our main sketch. And if we are not ready, we will show the instructions uh, for the viewer to know that they have to click the window. Okay? Uh, and maybe our main sketch here, I'm just going to erase the background again. Okay, just erase the background, but do nothing. Uh, so this is a simple framework where I can basically click and then go into some other state. I can just move on uh, based on the status of this ready variable. Now, this is important because now we know at this point in the code, when we go from not ready to ready, when we go from ready equals false to ready equals true, uh, this is the time where we can start to initialize all of our audio objects. Because now we know, okay, the user has clicked in the window, we have the green light, we are ready to go. So rather than, than dump all this code into mouse pressed here, we're going to 
do a, something slightly more organized and we're going to create a function called initialize audio. I just made that up. It doesn't have to be called that, but um, you know, this is going to represent what it does. So this is not a predefined name or anything. Uh, and when we switch from ready from false to true, we are going to simply here say initialize audio. We're going to call that function. And now we have a place where we can do all of our initial uh, audio object creation that we would normally do with setup um, if we uh, were just simply drawing things on the screen. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is uh, just for clarity here, uh, because we have a few different functions, I like to put these little visual dividers. That's totally optional, but um, I like to put little lines of comments uh, just to make it easier for myself to switch between uh, and switch between the different functions as I'm scrolling. All right. Um, so now we are ready to finally create our oscillator. Okay, so it was a little bit of uh, exposition, uh, but we had to go through this really important point first before we can even start to do any audio. So again, just to summarize, it's really important to wait for a mouse press uh, before we get anything going. And we've created that by using making a simple framework based on a Boolean variable. Uh, and uh, so the person knows interacting with our sketch, we even give them some instructions on what to do. All right, let's create our first oscillator. Now uh, I've declared a global variable up here um, called OSC for oscillator, short for oscillator. Um, we are going to create the oscillator saying new tone. So tone is the tone.js library. Uh, it has an kind of a global object called tone with a capital T. And then we'll say oscillator, like so. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, oscillators, uh, we can. There's some parameters we can provide and so forth. But just to be a little bit more explicit, I'm gonna do it like so. Uh, so oscillators have different uh, attributes. Uh, the two main things we want to determine to begin with is the type. So the oscillator type is going to be um, a, a word, one of four possible options I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's going to be a sine wave. Uh, other types would be triangle, square, or sawtooth, and we'll explore them in time in a second. So first we set the type, uh, and then we have to set the frequency. Now the frequency is interesting in Tone.js because the frequency is something called a signal. So that's the first uh, interesting concept we're going to run across here today. So a signal in Tone.js is a what's called an audio rate value. Uh, it's a value that can that can be manipulated by other objects in the library. Uh, let me show you what that means here. If we look at the oscillator, um, and we see that it has a frequency, so it has different properties here. Uh, we just set its type. Now we're going to set its frequency. Um, the frequency is something called a signal. Okay. So signals, let's click on that. Signals are basically objects that represent a value in the, so maybe like the pitch of an oscillator, maybe the, the, the level, the amplitude of, uh, of something. Uh, but these these signals they can be manipulated by Tone.js. Uh, so, for example, in a few minutes when we're done with the tutorial, we're going to take one oscillator that's going to have a particular pitch, and then we'll create a second oscillator to vary the pitch of that oscillator over time. Uh, so these are values, but they are dynamic. They can be controlled by other things in the program. So this is a long story, uh, just to say that we cannot change a signal uh, directly. So I am not able to say osc.frequency equals, let's say, 220 hertz, uh, because this is a, a signal object. What I have to do is I have to change its value. So inside the signal, there is a value, right? There's a value attribute. And this is the thing we go into change if we want to change the actual value of the signal. Um, and the signal has like other things it can do. It can do things like ramp from one number to another. Uh, it can be connected to something uh, to allow it to change its, uh, its value over time. So they're uh, fully fledged objects in the world of uh, Tone.js. But here we're simply going to set its value directly. <clears throat> All right. So uh, now if I hit play, obviously, and I click, nothing is going to happen. Uh, because simply creating an oscillator doesn't just make it play. Uh, in order to start to hear sound in Tone.js, we have to do a few more steps. 
Uh, first is we have to take this oscillator. So the oscillator, think of TonJS as a series of blocks, right? So each block uh, is either a signal or some kind of um, waveform generating thing or something that's going to process the sound. And in order to hear some sounds, we have to connect blocks together. And the last block in the chain, you can think of it as your speakers. This is the thing that's going to actually produce the audio output. <clears throat> so in uh, Tone.js, the way that we connect things to the speakers is we say uh, there's a built-in function called toDestination. Okay, so this calling this function is going to take our oscillator and internally in the library, it's going to connect it to the last block in the signal chain, uh, which is the destination. That's how they refer to it. I think of it as the speakers in our program. We'll see in a minute that we can also connect things in different ways, but in this um, chain, we are going to have one sound. So we're going to connect it directly to the output. Uh, in more advanced Tone.js examples, you know, we're going to maybe start to add things like effects to our sound. So in that scenario, we would take our oscillator, we would connect it to the effect block, maybe like a reverb or something like that. Then we would take that effect block and connect it to the final destination, the speakers. So first we have to uh, connect the oscillator to the audio output. Um, so this is the, the shorthand to do this to destination. Uh, let's take a look here at the documentation as well, just to show you a little bit um, how you would go about navigating this documentation uh, if you try to do things that are not covered in uh, the tutorial. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so this connects the output to the context destination node. Uh, in Tone.js, they refer to these, these blocks as nodes, and nodes are connected, and there's basically sound signal flowing through the nodes. Um, so connected to the destination. Now we still don't hear anything. Final step is we have to tell this oscillator to just get going. And the way we do this is we say osc.start. Okay. So if we don't start the oscillator, we've created the object, but it's not going to start generating audio material uh, unless we start it. And now uh, we can hear our frequency. Okay. So this is our pitch. Uh, this is in Hertz stop it here so it's not always in the background uh, of course if we increase the pitch this is higher pitched and if we lower the pitch right we have a lower note okay uh, these are all a notes by the way those of you recognize so uh, this is an a3 i believe <clears throat> okay so this is how we um we create an oscillator in uh in tone.js we create the oscillator object um, we set its type its frequency we start it and then um, we connect it to the destination node, which in the world of Tone.js is the final node in the chain. So now we just have a two, two node chain, the oscillator and the speakers. Uh, but we'll see we can alter that chain down the road. <clears throat> okay, uh, so now that we have an oscillator, um, we're going to do uh, a few things. Uh, first is we're going to talk about how we would um, draw this oscillator. It'd be nice if we could see the waveform uh, because eventually what we're going to do in this example is we're going to create a second oscillator. We're going to let them kind of drone off each other, just have slightly different frequencies, and then that's going to create some interesting beats in the sound, uh, and it's going to create some interesting visuals as well. Um, the other thing we'll talk about is uh, we're going to also bring that GUI into the mix because now that we have this oscillator, it would be nice if we could <clears throat> excuse me, change the pitch or maybe it's type uh, using an interface that we create. So we'll see how we could do this with that GUI as well. Um, so let's start with maybe just drawing the, uh, the oscillator. Now, if we want to draw the oscillator, if we want to draw the, the waveform that we're hearing in our program, uh, first we have to understand how um, <clears throat> sound is represented in digital form. Now we're used to pixel values in P5.js because we draw shapes, right? So we're used to pixels having coordinates and then uh, each color having like an R, G, and B component. That's how we represent um, pixels and colors. Uh, in the world of sound, what we're, the way we represent sound is through an array of what's called samples. And these samples are just amplitude volumes. If you picture a sound wave, right? I'm sure you've all seen a sound wave. Um, each of these sampled points along the sine wave are just digitized versions of the sound. And 
each point in the data represent a, a volume level. And if you play that back over time, well, you get your sound. <clears throat> so this, uh, this waveform, uh, if we want to get access to it, we have to use uh, what's called a waveform uh, node in Tone.js. So I'm going to create a variable here called waveform. Uh, and then just to show you where we are, let's uh, look for it in uh, the documentation. So, um, so we're going to use the waveform node that allows us to get the current um, sort of wave data for whatever audio source uh, we're connecting into it. <clears throat> so let's create a waveform and I'm making it global here because I want to have access to it in initialize audio to create it. And we're going to look at that waveform in draw as well later on to sort of see what are the audio samples we're hearing and then we're going to represent them on the screen. So the waveform is going to be a new tone dot waveform, the object we're creating. And um, <clears throat> here what we're going to do is instead of connecting the oscillator directly to the waveform, um, we're going to connect the waveform, we're going to connect uh, this tone.master object. Uh, so tone.master is, uh, is what we're connecting to when we go to the destination. So it's the final node in the chain, uh, kind of the master output. And the reason we're going to do this is we want to be able to draw the sum of all the sounds we're hearing. Uh, so right now we have just one oscillator, but when we add a second one, we also want to see what that oscillator does. So I'm going to say connect the last block in my chain that's producing sound, which is called tone.master. I'm going to connect it to this waveform node. Okay. So tone.js works with this sort of metaphor of you're connecting nodes to other nodes. Um, and you can imagine the signal going from one node to another. So when we say connect the master, to the waveform, we get the sound produced by the master node is going to be sent to the waveform node to be processed. And um, the waveform node is going to give us access to those individual samples. Right. <clears throat> Another fun thing we can do, by the way, with the master node uh, is we can change its volume. So that could be very helpful uh, if you find the sound a little bit too loud, uh, which I might do now because I'm talking over this. I'm going to turn the volume down. Uh, now, volume remember is a signal as well, right? So just like frequency, a volume is a signal, which means it's like a, a thing that can be manipulated by uh, other nodes in the system. So if we want to change the volume, we can't just assign it to something. We have to assign something to its value attribute. So just something to get used to with Tone.js, uh, these, these properties of objects that are signals, uh, we just have to go one extra step if we want to change their value and kind of dig inside, find that value attribute. Um, now, volume in Tone.js, it's expressed in decibel uh, by default. So uh, zero decibel. Uh, so it, if we want to change the, 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 the volume, right, we, we apply uh, a decibel change. So if I make it equal to zero, uh, there's going to be no change. And uh, something like minus six would be cutting down the volume in half. Okay? So six decibel is about half. So let's see if that did anything. Yeah, so you can hear um, this is quieter now. Uh, let's go a little further. I'm going to set it to nine. Okay, so it's a little bit quieter now, the sound, and I can more comfortably speak over it. Okay, so this is minus nine decibels. All right. <clears throat> Amazing. Now uh, we have this waveform object. So we've connected our tone master, tone dot master to it. And uh, now we're going to take a look at the samples in draw and uh, plot them on the screen. So let's see how we would do this. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead here. I'm going to set a white stroke and uh, let's turn off the fill for now. <clears throat> okay, so um, the way that the waveform works is it contains uh, what's called a buffer. Now the buffer in audio term is just an array basically and it contains a sequence of samples. Um, now, in this case, our waveform is generating sound over time, right? So at any given time, there is this buffer that is filled with a bunch of samples that our uh, speakers are just currently playing. Okay? That buffer uh, has a default value, uh, a default size, I think is 1,024 value. Uh, it can be changed, but this is sort of how much it's holding in one place. Uh, if you imagine, for example, if you load like an actual sound file that's many minutes long, 
uh, it doesn't actually hold every single sample of the file necessarily in the buffer. Uh, it just has a, a smaller buffer that it uses when it's playing. <clears throat> so we're going to take it and put it into a separate variable. Um, the waveform actually has more than one buffer because it is a, our sound is stereo, so it has a left and a right. Uh, so we're going to grab the left buffer by saying get value zero. Okay, so this is going to grab, uh, it doesn't matter in our case because we're not panning, so the both left and right speakers are going to be the same. Uh, so we're going to grab the left channel uh, or channel zero, okay? just for simplicity. Uh, and now we have this array uh, called buffer, and it's containing the sounds that are being, the samples this, that we're hearing um, at the output. <clears throat> so um, let's go ahead and just uh, just draw them as points, as a starting point. So we're going to write a for loop that's going to iterate over all the values we have in our array. And we can do it like so. And we're going to say let i equal 0 repeat until we reach the length of the buffer and increase by steps of one. Um, and then inside that for loop, we're going to say x is going to be our, uh, our i, our counter. So we're going to map this from left to right. So we'll say, let's go from zero to width. That's going to give us our x value, right? Going from zero to width. And then our y value is going to be the amplitude of our waveform. Now the, uh, the, ampli the, the samples inside this buffer are values between minus one and one. So you have zero in the middle, and then the waveform goes up and down above and below that uh, zero point. And it's just the way that the samples are represented in the audio buffer. Uh, they simply go from minus one and one. So if we just try to draw it face value, that would be really tiny. So we want to stretch this out to fill the entire height of our window. So we're going to use map again and say, uh, sorry, not I, uh, buffer bracket I. So this is the, the sample value here. So the numbers inside that array, I know are between minus one and one because they're audio samples. We're going to map this, stretch it to the full height of our window. Uh, and then let's drop a little point so we can see what we're doing. Cool. So now we can see our sine wave. And we'll be able to see that if we change the pitch, right? if we lower the pitch, um, the period right, increases. And uh, if we were to change the, the volume here, obviously the wave would get bigger as well. Okay, so let's go back to 220. Nice little tone here. So we get this buffer from our waveform object that is receiving the sound and then kind of doing uh, its job is to turn that into a buffer of samples we can access. Um, this can be useful for doing things like drawing the waveform, for instance. Uh, and then we draw it simply by going through all the samples we have and uh, plotting a point for each of them. So this is just going through this buffer array and then drawing it oh, from left to right. <clears throat> now let's improve on that a little bit. We're, we're going to draw it as a line instead of dots, uh, just because uh, the dots are, are nice, but let's draw a continuous line instead. Uh, so this is a very easy um, step uh, in terms of the next uh, next step in the progression, uh, we're going to use begin shape. Okay, so instead of drawing points, we're going to say begin shape and shape, and we're going to draw vertices. So that will allow us to draw this, uh, this sequence of connect of points, connect them with a line. Okay. So now we have a continuous line here for our uh, sound wave. Okay, so it's a little bit nicer. Now, one thing that's happening here is um, we can see that it's, it doesn't look very stable. And that's because uh, this buffer, right, this arbitrary buffer that, again, don't quote me, and I'd have to open up the docs, but I'm pretty sure is 1,024 values. Um, it's just kind of picking an arb, like it's just an arbitrary moment in time. Uh, and our waveform here, it's, it's phase, which means when the zero point starts, that means it's always kind of changing. It's always moving from left to right. So it would be nice if we could see this waveform in a little bit more of a stable way. So in order to accomplish this, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that we search for what's called a zero crossing point, which means we're going to look for the point when the waveform goes from a negative value to a positive value. Okay? And that will indicate the start where we want to start drawing our waveform. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to sort of not necessarily try to draw the entire buffer. We're only going to draw a section of it. We're going to 
stop the sound here. We're only going to draw a section of it uh, because we're dealing with like a, a repeating periodic waveform. Um, we're going to sort of say, okay, let's find a section in the buffer where we always start from the same place, right? A line going up, and then we're going to always draw the same length, and that's going to allow us to sort of lock in onto our frequency a little bit more. Okay? So if it's not clear what I mean here, or just we're going to go through it, and it will make sense as we go along. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to find a a consistent starting point to draw our waveform. So right now the buffer, you know, we could be at any place in the sine wave, right? So we're going to look for a starting point. Uh, so let's create a variable. We're going to say start from zero, and then uh, we're going to write a for loop that's going to search through the buffer. Okay, so we're going to try to look at every sample, uh, and we want to look for a scenario where the previous sample is going to be is going to be less than zero. And then the next sample after that is going to be greater than zero. So we went from below zero to above zero. Okay, so we have a zero crossing in that direction. We could do it bottom as well. It doesn't really matter. Um, and in order to achieve this, uh, we're going to do a little trick here. So because we want to compare the current value and the previous value, we're simply going to start counting from one instead of zero. And what that's going to allow me to do is this. I'm going to say if buffer i minus 1. Okay, so that's going to be when we start our loop, that's going to be 1 minus 1, so bracket 0. If I started counting from 0, I would be in trouble because that would be a negative index. So we'll just start counting from 1. So we'll say if that value is less than 0, okay, and so we'll put an and here. Remember, this is the double ampersand means and, which means both conditions in the if have to be true. If the buffer at the current i value so that's going to be one in the case of one when the loop first runs. We'll say if the next value is greater or equal to zero. Okay, so if we were below zero and then the next one in the series is above zero, we know we found a point where we're crossing, right? we're doing crossing the, uh, the zero point, the zero line. So if that happens, we are going to say we found where we want to start. We'll say start from this point, I. Okay. <clears throat> and um, we now we're done, so we don't have to go through the rest of the array. So we're going to use this keyword here called break. Now break uh, interrupts the for loop. Okay, so this is a very useful uh, keyword when you're trying to create these types of little kind of algorithms. So we say start from zero and then search for this condition. Once we found it, we're going to break, and that's going to tell the for loop to end prematurely before it, it reaches this end condition, which is going to abort the for loop that we are contained, uh, that the break is contained with it. Okay, so now we found a starting point. So what we're going to do here is when we draw the samples, we're going to start counting from uh, i equals start instead of zero. Okay? <clears throat> and that means we have to change our mappings a little bit. Um, we are going to change, now i is going to go from start, right? So on the for the x-axis, and let's see what that looks like. Okay. So already, right, a little bit of an improvement. And um, interesting, this is actually the opposite. But it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is we're finding a consistent um, point here where to start. I'm a little confused as to where it's going down, but uh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we're always kind of starting drawing our waveform from the same place. Now there's a, a little bit of an interesting thing that happens here, and then there's kind of like this moving of the waveform, and that's because uh, the sound is not changing, but our mapping here is is uh, is changing, right? So the, we're always going to the very end of the buffer, but our starting point is different every time, a little bit. It varies, uh, so that means the number of samples we're drawing right now kind of shrinks or grows based in depending on where we find that that synchronous, that point we want to start from, right? The zero crossing. So to fix that, we're simply going to say, don't try to draw all the sample. We're always going to draw the same number of samples. And um, we're going to just go with half the buffer, okay? So that we know, it's probably a good guess that um, we're going to find a zero crossing way before we reach half of the values. So instead of always drawing um, the full buffer, we are going to draw just half the buffer. So we're going to create a variable here. Um, we're going to call it uh, end. Okay. So the end point 
is going to be uh, half the buffer plus the starting point. Okay. So now we found a starting point and we'll say we want to go from that starting point add half of the buffer and this is where we end. So that in every frame we're always going to draw the same number of samples. The only thing that's going to change is where we begin okay, in the in the, the starting point here. So let's change some for loops here. So that means we're not going to go all the way to buffer.length. Let's turn off the sound. Um, we are going to go to end, right? So we're going to go from start to end, and then we're going to map here from start to end as well. Let's see the difference. <clears throat> all right. So now we have a much more um, kind of like consistent looking wave here. There's still like a little bit of jitteriness in there, and that's because, um, you know, this is not a, it's a digital system, but it's not an analog system. So there's like some variations in the, the samples, right, from uh, when we start and so forth. So in any case, um, this is going to become uh, a little bit less apparent uh, as we go along and uh, change the frequency as well and so forth. Okay, so this is how we would draw the waveform. So where we're drawing our waveform, now we can see our uh, oscillator. Uh, let's now talk about how we would add an interface so that we can start to explore a little bit uh, different types and also different frequencies so we can interact with that oscillator. <clears throat> so to add the interface, uh, we're going to bring in that GUI again that we've been using uh, since the beginning of this series. So I'm going to copy the script tag here. I'm going to install the library by simply pasting the script tag into my index. I'm going to save that, go back to my sketch, and minimize this side window again. <clears throat> All right, so uh, now we can create our GUI. Okay. And I accidentally did something here to set up. My bad. OK, let's fix that. All right, uh, so now we can create our GUI. So in the past, uh, when we created the GUI, right, we went and we created a settings object, right? So for example, if we wanted to change, like, maybe the frequency, we would create a frequency setting, right? This is how we've approached um, adding things to our GUI. We created this intermediate object that held all of the values we, were, we wanted to tweak with the GUI. Um, but really, there's no rule that this has to be, like, one specific object. Um, when we're playing with Tone.js, like these variables we have here, like this oscillator, is already a JavaScript object. Uh, it has attributes right, that we might want to modify. Right? It has, for example, the frequency has a value attribute that we might want to modify. Um, so we don't need to create an intermediate variable um, necessarily. We can just connect our GUI uh, objects. We're going to connect them directly so our oscillator, um, instead of using the intermediate sort of settings variable. Uh, and the reason for that is I want the slider to actually go and change this value variable, or we're going to create a drop down menu to select from different uh, types. And we don't need to add a middleman to that process, right? Because otherwise, if we do this, then we have to write some code that responds to changes in the UI that would then change our Tone.js objects. Let's just connect them directly. We're going to do this in initialize audio uh, because I need to wait until I have my audio objects created before I try to connect them to the GUI. So we're going to create our GUI over here. And um, <clears throat> we are going to connect, right? So we're going to give, so the value ultimately I want to change is this variable here. Let's start, start with the pitch. <clears throat> so we're going to take osc.frequency. Okay? So this is the object we're going to give to the GUI. So this is a, a signals object. It's just a JavaScript object. And we know that inside of it, it has a variable called value. Okay, so this is the value I want to be able to change. Uh, and then just like we did before, we're going to give it a range. So let's say we want to be able to go from 110 to 330 hertz. Okay, so every time you double or half a frequency, you go down one octave and up one octave. So then we'll have a two octave range of notes to listen to. So let's try that. So now I have a slider, and it's connected to this value variable, which is part of osc.frequency. Okay. And now I can change the pitch with the slider. Pretty neat, right? 
Uh, another thing, by the way, you can do with these sliders, uh, if, if you find this is a little bit too limiting, like the size here, you can also, uh, of course, you can enter values directly over here. Uh, or if you click the number and you move your mouse up and down, so this is this is increasing in steps of 10 right now, but we'll, we'll change that in a second to make this more like micro steps. Uh, so if you want to have fine adjustments, you have like the entire range that you can move up and down if you keep your mouse button pressed. All right. <clears throat> um, so we can connect that GUI to any any object basically in, in the program. That's kind of the, the main takeaway here. It doesn't have to be a separate settings object. Um, any object that you create, you can tell that GUI to go in and move its variables for you uh, using the sliders. So uh, it's just about figuring out. So this is the object we're passing right now, osc.frequency, and we're changing the value variable of that object. Now, the, the annoying thing with that is uh, this value, right? It's not a name that we chose. It's just the way this is called, right? So uh, it means that the, the UI here says the word value. So this is not really helpful. I would like this to say, frequency instead. So this is something we can do as well. Once we've created um, a slider, we can change its name. So the way that works in that GUI is that when you add something to the GUI, there's a, actually a, a variable that gets returned back. There's an object that gets returned back um, in, in that GUI terms. They call this a controller, I think. Uh, but it's basically any kind of user interface element. So I'm going to catch it here and put it into this slider variable. Yeah, I just gave it a name. And um, now this is an object that we can also add some additional, you know, some additional options that were not part of this add function. So for, for example, one thing it does have is it has a name function we can use. So I could change the name of the slider by doing this. Now it's called frequency, right? So that's pretty useful. Um, we could also change the, the steps. So here uh, it's stepping in, in steps of, uh, of one, right? So we could say, if we want to be a little bit more precise, let's go in steps of 0 0.1, okay? Because uh, when we add things, that GUI just kind of guesses what the step should be based on the numbers provided. So see, now I can go, I can have decimal points. Uh, and that also means when I'm scrolling over here, instead of moving in steps of 10, now this is in steps of 0 0.1. So I can be very precise about, you know, tuning my oscillator. So GUI.add returns an object that we can catch here uh, in its own variable. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what that also means is oftentimes, if you look at that GUI examples, uh, what they will do is they will do what's called chaining. So instead of creating a temporary variable here called slider, uh, we can simply, uh, every function call on, on this slider object always returns the object itself. And what that means is we can write the same thing here. I'm going to just uh, comment it out so we keep it as a reference. We can write the same thing like this. We can just say GUI.add slider, uh, dot add here, right? and we know that at the end, this returns a value. So we can add a dot right there, and we could say dot step 0 0.1. And then the step function returns the slider again. So we can say dot name frequency. So this is like a little, a little kind of like clunkier syntax, but it is shorter. So you'll see that sometimes uh, in that GUI examples. What they're doing is they're doing what's called method chaining. Um, so this function call returns an object that you then just call one of its functions right away, and that returns the same object, and then you can call another function on it right away. So these things do the same thing. Uh, one of them does it in kind of just one line. Uh, the other one does it more explicitly by creating a temporary variable. So let's stick with this version for um, just because it's more concise. All right. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that would be cool to change is the type of our oscillator. So we said there's four different types, right? We have um, sine. Let's create an array here. We have sine. We have triangle, square. And the last one is sawtooth. Uh, these are the four kind of basic waveforms. Uh, and because this oscillator type here is a string, uh, if we add this to our GUI, so now we're going to, we want to change this type variable. So we're going to add simply the OSC object. And we'll say, what do I want to change the type? 
And because type is a string, if we pass here as the, instead of a range of numbers, we're going to simply put this array of oscillator types. Uh, it's automatically going to understand this as a series of choices of options, and it's going to give us a drop down menu. So now we have a drop down, and we have the four options that we define here in the oscillator types. So we said change on the OSC object, the type variable, which is not a signal, so we can change it directly, and these are the options, right? So we can have triangle, square, that's loud, uh, sawtooth. Right? Let's go back to sign. <clears throat> so these are the different um, waveforms we can have. Uh, so now we have an oscillator and we have a waveform that we can draw and we also added some GUI controls that we can use to change our oscillator. Okay. So like, let's take this, this example here and move it, nudge it a little bit more in the generative domain. Okay. So one of the simplest things, uh, but one thing that I find a lot of fun that we can do with oscillators is we can create what's called drones. Now drones are simply um, just oscillators like this, free running oscillators. And if we kind of line them up um, in a certain way, we're going to create two oscillators uh, as a starting point. And then for your exercise, you can go not and experiment. Uh, we're going to create two oscillators and then we'll see what happens when we just kind of slightly vary the frequency of one of the oscillators. Okay. So let's add a second oscillator here. I'm just going to call it OSC2. Okay. Not very uh, inspired here. Uh, and for simplicity, I am going to simply copy and paste here. And this one, I'm just going to call it OSC2. Okay, so now we're going to have two oscillators. Note that we're both connecting them to the same destination. So we can connect more than one signal into the same node. And then that node will still give us the waveform. So what we're going to see now is the combination of these two oscillators. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we're just going to leave this uh, second oscillator here. We're going to leave it at 220. So I could I could go in and add uh, GUI options, but we're not going to do that just yet. We'll just have an option to change the first oscillator. Now the first thing that's interesting to note that has happened now is the um, the amplitude has gone up. Right. Notice if we add the second oscillator, everything is louder now. That's because the two oscillators they match perfectly. So when the waveforms overlap perfectly, the volumes get added together. Okay. So this becomes louder. Um, if they no longer match, right, now we can see that we have a little bit more variation. Um, so what we can hear, the detuning of these oscillators, uh, that creates kind of different beats, different rhythms when these oscillators happen to line up and when they don't. And this is something we can explore. Uh, it, that's, this is what we can explore in the world of drones, right? So we want to tune these oscillators to find interesting beats. So this is just the two sine waves playing off each other. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we get an interesting sound, but also interesting visuals as well that come out of it. Right? So this is you know, kind of a way of thinking about generative sound as a very simple starting point, um, because we create a framework where we have two simple elements, right? two sine waves, and then we're interested in kind of the complex interactions between them. When they're like almost in pitch, we can hear some beat frequencies. Cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, so those are basically um, drones, right? Now, of course, uh, we can build on that idea. We can add more oscillators. Um, we're going to just do a few more uh, tweaks to this program. First is uh, let's add. Um, <clears throat> let's add, uh, excuse me, let's add an oscillator type for the second oscillator we just added. So we're going to go oscillator two. Uh, we're going to add oscillator type here. Uh, we'll still leave the frequency for the first one. Uh, we could make the frequency for the second one, but in a minute, we'll make the frequency of the second one be controlled by um, a low frequency oscillator. So that one's going to move on its own, okay, just to add a little bit of interest. Uh, so we're going to create this. Now, uh, the trick here is this is this is the same name twice, right? So not very helpful. 
So just like we did up here, uh, we're going to change the name to oscillator one type and oscillator two type. Okay. So just so we know, these are going to be different, um, different options, right? So now we can play with this a bit. Um, you know, let's we could have like triangle triangles that's going to change the look of the shapes that we're getting out of this. Um, square waves. Square waves get really, really harsh. Um, it's a bit loud. Okay. <clears throat> or, oh, you can have a mix, right? We could have a sawtooth. Sawtooths are also a little bit harsh. Um, yeah, so we can play around with this and have some fun. Uh, so we can change the second oscillator type now. Uh, and then uh, we're also going to let the uh, the second oscillator just move by itself. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to take advantage of the fact that the frequency is a signal. It's something that our our program can uh, can change over time by itself. <clears throat> and we're going to make it change by connecting it to a third oscillator. Now this one is going to be what's called a low frequency oscillator. And what low frequency means is that it's frequency is going to be very low, too low that if we were to try to play this as a sound, we wouldn't be able to hear it. We're talking about fractions of a hertz. Um, it's lower frequency oscillator means that it's going to be, it's going to move at a, such a slow speed uh, that is going to be useful more for changing parameter values in our program. So we can use it, for example, to vary the frequency value over time. <clears throat> so let's create a, a variable here. I'm going to call it LFO, that's usually short for low frequency oscillator. Uh, and low frequency oscillators have their own object in Tone.js called an LFO. Uh, that's specifically designed to handle these very low frequencies. Uh, so let's go, let's start with like a one hertz, uh, which is one whole uh, cycle per second. And uh, we're going to vary the values from 200 to 240. So that's going to be the range of this LFO, right? It's going to vary from 200 to 240, right? And um, just like the um, just like the, uh, the other oscillators, it has a, a waveform type. The default is a sine wave, but we can change that. We're going to leave it to be the default. Um, and then we're going to connect this LFO. So this LFO is going to output a, a number from 200 to 240. We're going to connect it to the second OSC, the second oscillator's frequency signal. So you can imagine this is like taking a virtual cable saying, take this number that's going to moving, be moving up and down slowly, and we're going to let it control this second OSC's frequency. And we can do that because this is a signal object in Tone.js. And then, of course, just like any other oscillator, we have to tell it to start. So you can see now we have this thing where this is changing um, by itself, right? We have the, if we don't start the first oscillator, I'm just going to comment that out for a second. This is what our low frequency oscillator is doing to the second oscillator. It's varying its frequency from 200 to 240. Uh, we could make it go really, really slow, like 0.1. So that we had a slow, kind of a slow sweep, slow scan of the frequencies. So that might be nice for a drone. We want something maybe that's more slowly changing, slowly evolving. Uh, and then let's bring back our OSC.start. So now, uh, even if we don't touch this control here, um, we are kind of sweeping some of the different beat frequencies uh, because we have this low frequency oscillator changing the pitch of the second oscillator. And we can still play with the pitch of the first one and kind of have it move around and go higher pitch or lower pitch. Right? So, pretty fun. Uh, drones are not for everyone, but I enjoy them. Uh, I find like uh, you can do a lot of fun things, uh, especially as you start to add more oscillator, you can start to add some complexity to the sound. Um, maybe you can <clears throat> explore if you're feeling ambitious. Um, you can explore uh, filters. Uh, there's filters in, uh, excuse me, filters in uh, Tone.js. Um, so I'll leave that as an exercise, a little bit more of an advanced idea. Uh, but 
we'll uh, leave it at that for now. Um, the last thing we're going to do uh, to wrap up this first lesson on Tone.js is we'll do a, just a small little tweak here to make our visualization a little bit more interesting. Uh, so instead of drawing this as a line, um, we're going to draw this as a shape. We're already there, right? We're already drawing begin shape here. Um, we are drawing it as a line and we're not really closing the shape. So let's close the shape and see what happens. Uh, we're going to close the shape and we're going to set a white fill as well. Um, this is kind of connecting this back also to the, our drawing machine concept. So we're going to use this drone here uh, as a way of creating just uh, interesting visuals. Um, <clears throat> so we can see that we, we connect the last point to the first one. We get this shape, okay, which is interesting, but not necessarily what I'm going for. What I'd like to do is just kind of fill the bottom half of the window with my waveform and then leave the top half black. So what we're going to do is we're going to add two points to this shape. We're going to add one point on the bottom right corner and then another point on the bottom left corner at the end here. We'll say, but let's add in one more vertex. I'm going to say width and height. So that's the bottom right corner. And then we're going to add one more vertex. That's going to be zero and height. That's the bottom left just to kind of fill in the shape here. And then we will get this. Uh, so now we're drawing the oscillator, right? And uh, we, are, we are closing here the shape by adding two more points, and then it's gonna get closed back to the beginning. <clears throat> so this is kind of neat, because uh, now we can create like some interesting mountains almost uh, that are based on our drones here. Uh, and just to make it a little smoother and l less hectic, um, we are going to do the good old trick of drawing a black background with some alpha value, some transparency. Yeah, so that's nice. Uh, so that now the waveforms, even though they're changing rapidly, is kind of fading over time a little bit more. Cool. Um, now we can explore a little bit. We can mix some shapes, right? Just try to play around. Um, Uh, so there's lots you could do with this uh, to take it a little bit further. Um, I would encourage, encourage you to try, you know, adding a few more oscillators to see what happens, um, you know, changing what the LFO is controlling, uh, playing with the frequency of the LFO and so forth. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so try to have some fun with this uh, example, build your own uh, drones and um, think about also how you could exploit the waveform to sort of turn that into compelling visuals that are linked to the sound that we're hearing. Okay, so we'll leave it at that for this week. Uh, this was our introduction to Tone.js and oscillators. Uh, we will build on that next week uh, when we're going to create more sort of structured sequences. Um, I'll see you then.